welcome to this debate. Uh, 20 years in Afghanistan, what happened? It's probably the biggest topic of the summer. The events of this summer have posed questions that are possibly even as big as 9-11 um, itself 20 years ago. Is it a really big moment? Is it a new era like 9-11? Um, is it the end of the dominance um, of the West? What actually happened? Um, what happened to the mission, the nation building uh, mission? What did it all mean? And that's what we're going to be talking about when we say 20 years in Afghanistan, what happened? It touches on everything else that people are thinking about in terms of what does geopolitics mean today? Is it changing? Are there new powers uh, rising? What about the United States? My name is Bruno Waterfield. Um, I'm a journalist. I work for the Times newspaper um, in Brussels. We've got a fantastic uh, panel and I'm going to introduce them very, very briefly in the order, the, the order in which they're um, going to speak. And I'll do what we call in the newspaper business a C-REF. If you want to find out more about these panellists, and particularly about the books um, that they've written or what they get up to or to get in touch with them, go on the website, click on their name, and there's lots of information. So first of all, uh, speaking, we will have Bruno Masses, who is Senior Advisor at uh, Flint Global, but he writes a lot of books, and he's got a new book out, which is... Geopolitics for the End Time. Then we've got Mick Hume, um, who's a Battle of Ideas veteran, spike columnist, um, and writes books as well. Last book, uh, Revolting, How the Unders Nearly Undermined Democracy. Then, right on my extreme right here, we have uh, Ali Mirage, um, who is a columnist, uh, a DJ. Um, he's the founder of the Contrarian Prize. He's on Times Radio a lot, so he's a good guy. Um, and he's also an infrastructure financier. He buys airports. He, uh, we were talking in the corridor. He buys airports for like two billion euros or pounds, whatever the currency. Um, after Ali, we've got Phil Cunliffe, um, who's senior lecturer in politics and international relations and the author of Cosmopolitan Dystopia, International Intervention and the Failure of the West. So someone good to have on this panel. And then um, speaking at the end, or finally, is uh, Paymana Assad, um, and she's of Afghan origin. She came here as a refugee in 2018, and she is the first Afghan in Britain to be elected to public office. Um, and she's a founder of the Labour Foreign Policy Group, which is a, a group uh, of activists who are endeavouring uh, to get the Labour Party to have a foreign policy, um, or to get Lisa Landy to have a, a foreign policy. So that's the order of the speakers. Without further ado, I give you Bruno. Yeah, thank you, Bruno. And it's, it's very, I'm used in panels to be the only Bruno all of It's very disturbing. It's very disturbing. Uh, let's see if this is working. So uh, um, I happened to be in Kabul the, the week before and wrote a few pieces for the New Statesman. Um, but I, as you say, Bruno, I think this is about a lot more than Afghanistan. It would be important enough if it was about Afghanistan or about Central Asia. I think it's a lot more, and it, comes, it has come to symbolize a lot of things that are happening around the world at this time, particularly uh, a newfound Western difficulty projecting its power and being able to influence societies uh, all over the world, and I think Afghanistan has come to represent that. What can we say about what happened? Uh, you know, I'm uh, on record already saying that I think it was an unmitigated disaster, and you don't even have to, to think about... Uh, the decision in, in, in 2001 uh, or the 20 year war and occupation, just concentrate on the last year or two. There was, of course, an agreement in Doha that not only was not respected, but uh, the United States showed no interest in, in trying to enforce it. I think that was the beginning of all problems. The Taliban made commitments about political inclusiveness uh, that were not only not enforced, but again, no one was interested in going back to that agreement, which wasn't signed 20 years ago. It was signed February 2020. Yeah. Then uh, just the last month, uh, what did it show? This a catastrophic evacuation, in my opinion, uh, because the problem with the evacuation was not that it, it didn't conclude 
before the Taliban arrived. You know, we always criticize the Saigon evacuation. It started two weeks before the North Vietnamese arrived in Saigon, and it concluded just before, as we know from the images. Uh, in, in Kabul, it didn't conclude before the Taliban arrived. It didn't start before the Taliban arrived. It didn't start to be planned before the Taliban arrived. It was on Sunday, August 15th, that Victoria Nolan started to make phone calls about organizing some of the evacuation efforts. I mean, this is unthinkable. And I think it's important to go back to this, just how unthinkable it is. Those of us who were there in Kabul, we all knew what was coming. We knew it was going to be within days, a week maximum. I was planning my departure flight on the basis of what everyone talked about. And to hear at the same time President Biden and, Sec and Secretary Blinken say that this could take between three and six months was very disturbing in the sense of two parallel realities. But the, the, the sort of the delusional interpretation of events was in fact in charge. And people's lives depended not on the real interpretation on the ground, but on some delusional interpretation. So all this was, was awful in my opinion, and obviously I'm still receiving messages from some friends in Kabul that are still desperate and, and still trying to get out. Uh, and uh, obviously we don't know how things will really turn for the worse, but I'm convinced they will one way or another. But putting that all to the side, I want to focus on what I think was perhaps the most striking and also disturbing part of the story. And that, in my opinion, is the American and Western and European inability to have an influence on Afghanistan. Because what really struck me is that after a 20-year effort, everything collapsed. There's nothing left. By the way, that was really what saddened many diplomats in Kabul that after all this effort, lives lost, lives invested, 20 years of your life spent, uh, uh, a lot of money invested as well. There's nothing left. Everything collapsed uh, like a, uh, uh, a, a, a pack of cards. Uh, there is really very little that you can point to, and this is the outcome, the product of our efforts in Afghanistan. There are many people who got an education because of the Western presence, but uh, if you look at the country and a political situation, now there's nothing left because the government is not an inclusive government. The government has four or five UN listed terrorists uh, in the cabinet. And it's very striking to, to look at it and, and see uh, that uh, that effort didn't culminate in anything, that the Afghan state didn't exist, that the Afghan army didn't exist. Uh, is it possible? for a country as powerful as the United States to live in this illusion for so long that there was a real army, that there was a real state, when in fact it was, I think it's the best description of what you had there, a Potemkin village. And that American visitors would arrive and they'd see a Potemkin village, go back, very happy about what they saw, but there was nothing else, nothing left, and everything <coughs> collapsed. I'll conclude with, with one thought. Uh, I was talking about a famous Silicon Valley entrepreneur that is now turned to geopolitics. Uh, and we had a conversation the other day. He said something that I, I thought was, was interesting and, and also a bit, a bit scary. He said, look, when my management style, I leave all my workers alone uh, and all my managers. But when I find something really wrong, then I get completely paranoid. Because I start thinking, if this went so wrong, then everything in the company could potentially be just as wrong. And I don't trust anything anymore. I stop, I fire everyone, I look at everything point by point. And shouldn't that be the reaction to what happened here? Do you really trust American power in other parts of the world? Would you conclude Afghanistan was, I think I, I gave a reasonably good description of what a disaster it was. Do you think it's possible that Afghanistan was this disaster and American policy in all other places is perfect? Do you trust American intelligence and preparation for a conflict in Taiwan? Mm -hmm. This for me is, all, is an important question to ask mm -hmm. her because I suddenly don't know anything. You know, I don't know the extent to which what is being prepared in other parts of the world is, is just as disastrous. And I certainly would be very reluctant if I, as a European to trust that America will solve our problems in Northern Africa, Eastern Europe, the Middle East. And those problems are coming closer and closer, if not already here. Thank you, Bruno. Me. Yeah. Unlike uh, Bruno, but like most of you, I wasn't in uh, Kabul. I was watching it all unfold on uh, television and was very struck by uh, people being really taken aback by that disaster unfolding uh, at the airport and in the city. And some it's kind of, where did this come from? How, how have we gone from being what seemed to be everything was okay and suddenly everything is collapsing around our ears? I think it's very important that we go back and establish the fact that the intervention in Afghanistan was a disaster 
from the moment the Americans and the British and the NATO forces uh, uh, invaded uh, and intervened. Um, we should be clear that the problem, the underlying problem in Afghanistan was not the absence or the withdrawal of Western forces, but was them being there in the first place. That's the kind of bedrock uh, of the problem that we, we've got to address. And what they did was they managed to stretch out that disaster for 20 years, and then, in the way that Bruno's just described, by a miracle, they managed to make, at the end, with the withdrawal, they managed to make it actually even worse, which is quite an achievement. Uh, even by the standards of um, uh, imperialist uh, cock-ups around the world. Um, we say, oh, uh, people say, well, how come the Americans didn't know what was going to happen in Afghanistan? How come they said the Taliban might be hanging around for a, a month and they took over in 15 minutes? Well, I don't think the West has ever really known what's happening in Afghanistan. They've never really been very interested in Afghanistan, never really cared about it very much. Afghanistan was just a backdrop. The war in Afghanistan, was, from the West point of view, from the Western powers point of view, was never really about Afghanistan. It was about an attempt after 9-11 to project a sense of Western and American in particular, and Britain, particularly under, under Tony Blair, having a mission, having a sense of purpose, standing for something in the world. And, and Afghanistan became a kind of backdrop, a, 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 a playground for that, largely for domestic political uh, consumption. If we do go right back to 2001, um, when all this started, um, 20 years ago, I was, uh, we were just uh, spiked online, had, was just kind of taking off, 2001, and I was the, the launch editor. And because I knew I was, had to come and talk about it, I was, went back and looked at some of the stuff that we wrote around then, which I think, by the way, is worth uh, uh, reviewing because it stands, it stands at the, the test of time a lot of it. Um, and there's a sense that uh, when 9 11 happened, the terrorist attack on, on, on New York and America, uh, George Bush declared after that, We're at war. And I wrote an article on Spike to the point, We're at war, but who with? didn't know who they were at war with. They'd kind of declared war. It's not normally the way you do things. Normally you have an enemy, you identify the enemy, and then you declare war. What the Americans did, what Bush did after 9-11 was, he declared war on nobody in particular, on terror. On, when they start declaring war on abstract nouns, you know you're in trouble. Okay? <laughs> so he declared war, and then they had to find an enemy to fight. And so they, they found Afghanistan and the Taliban, which you know had some loose connection with training camps and everything. But the people who committed 9-11 were not Afghanistan farmers from uh, uh, Bora Bora or anywhere like that. They were very sophisticated, westernised, European and American educated Saudis. They weren't, you know, it, was a, it had nothing to do with it. But it, it was a suitable target for, um, uh, for um, 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 making a point. And from the start, so you already had a sense of what, what is it about? A sense of confusion and uncertainty right from the start. Um, and I think for 20 years, you, what you had in Afghanistan is really a kind of a war without clear war rates. Um, imperialism without purpose. Uh, and you see the shifting excuses. If you look at the first 10 years, the, the reason that they were in there changed almost on a kind of annual basis. Um, first of all, we were fighting terror, then that wasn't working. So uh, we were actually there for, to defend women's rights, which is, you know, cruelly ironic now when you see that what's uh, likely to happen to in Afghanistan uh, in, the, in the immediate future. Then it became part of a war on drugs. Uh, as far as the British and, and American governments were concerned. Again, if they declare war on, on an abstract noun, that's a problem. If they start declaring war on inanimate objects like drugs, that's also always a telltale sign that they don't know really what they're doing. Um, and finally, it became a war for democracy. And, uh, and Blair and, 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 and Brown, in particular in Britain, tried to make it sound like that, to, be, to show that they were um, good guys in Afghanistan was the proof of a good war. Never mind the bad wars in Afghanistan, Af uh, in uh, Iraq. Uh, Afghanistan was supposed to be the good war. And Obama came in and stepped up American military engagement to 100,000 troops uh, under, under Obama uh, to try and pursue this kind of shifting terrain of not really knowing what they were there for and what, what their purpose was. And Bruno mentioned the, the debate about nation building and the idea that the West was uh, nation building Afghanistan. It should be clear in the first place, even with the best world in the world, it's not possible to build nations from outside by sending in military forces. Okay? Since Thomas Cromwell wrote the Act in Restraint of Appeals in 1533 for Henry VIII, nations are built from within as a rejection of external power. That's how nations and nation states have been founded for the last 500 years. So even in, even in principle, it's a bizarre idea, um, and it's just an excuse for a, a, a territorial, territorial intervention. But I would also argue in Afghanistan, did they really even try to build a nation or a state? Or was it really, as Bruno was talking about, um, you know, 
a Potemkin village, a Potemkin state, a kind of bubble behind a barricade, a barricade around um, uh, Kabul, while the rest of the country was kind of handed over to, to uh, uh, the warlords, and a, uh, a bubble that when the Taliban offered the merest kind of uh, pin to it, uh, was very quickly deflated. You know, um, the former head of Médecins Sans Frontières wrote something when uh, uh, the Americans pulled out last month, making the point that his experience of, of, of being there in Afghanistan, he said it was completely surreal. The Americans, for, after the first few years, when the Americans and the Allied forces had casualties, and you can only feel for them and for all the Afghan uh, people that were killed for no purpose whatsoever in that war. But after that, they basically weren't fighting at all. The Americans were sitting in their bases, um, enjoying all the kind of Hershey bars and comforts of, uh, of an American base. And he, as he said, they had no commercial interaction with Af Afghanis Afghani society at all. Yet he doubted if in the last five or six years any American troop had, soldier had been into a, an Afghan uh, village or, or, or home. Um, there were other NATO forces, there, I think the Italians come to mind, who part of the... Um, Part of the rules that they were given was you're not allowed to leave the base. There are rules of engagement, but you're not allowed to engage with Afghan society. So it's a kind of pretend, pretend kind of um, uh, nation building effort. And it really wasn't uh, any surprise, I think, that um, it, it collapsed so quickly. Okay. I think in the end, then, uh, sorry, I've only got 30 seconds, uh, a, a defeat for imperialism, but one that's very hard to celebrate because um, what's going to happen to Afghanistan? Now we can only hope for the best, but I, and, uh, I think prepare for the worst. Um, uh, and uh, it's destabilising international relations. And it points to, which I haven't got time to go into now, a real crisis of values in the West. Because what we've had is the American and British governments try, pretending to defend values in Afghanistan that, as the debate that this weekend has shown, they can't defend at home. So we need to sort out what it is we want to fight for uh, in the future. Thank you, Mick. Thank you, Bruno, and uh, thank you to the Battle of Ideas for hosting this very important session. Bruno mentioned that I'm a, uh, a house music DJ. Well, um, we can be assured that uh, Abdul Ghani Baradar is not going to allow any pulsating house music beats to be wafting through the Kabul air anytime soon, uh, despite the fact that the Taliban have tried to portray this cuddly image that they clearly have cultivated. Uh, by potentially uh, hiring a very expensive PR firm over the last 20 years. Um, my central uh, proposition that I want to begin with is that um, the decision of the Biden administration to withdraw from Afghanistan after 20 years, um, the question is not why Biden uh, decided to withdraw, whether it was right or not. The central question for me is why the US did not put out 10 years before when Osama bin Laden was killed in Abdabad in uh, northern Pakistan back in 2011. And for those who are in some way surprised that uh, a Democrat president, uh, who they thought would mark um, a, a difference to the Trump administration before him, uh, clearly haven't been spending any time looking at Joe Biden's uh, protestations on the matter or his stance on it. Uh, 10 years ago when Obama sorry, back in 2010 when Obama did the troop surge of 100,000 troops, Biden was one of the lone voices uh, saying that it should not happen. Um, I want to depart from uh, Mick's point that there was no fundamental reason for going into Afghanistan. I, I disagree with that. I think there was. I think it was clearly on the back of 9-11, which was the worst attack on American soil since Pearl Harbor, three, almost 3,000 Americans killed. And the reason why... They went in to Afghanistan, why it was a NATO mission was because uh, the Taliban were providing um, safe haven to Al-Qaeda, to terrorists, uh, which partly is down to um, Afghan, I mean, the Taliban tradition, the Pashto tradition of like defending your guests with honor, effectively giving up your country uh, on the back of it to pretend your, uh, to, to protect your guests. Um, so that was the reason why uh, the West went in. But then hubris is a, is a seductive thing. And they ended up staying, having neutralized a bin Laden threat um, just within a year, frankly. Uh, they ended up staying, and then, the, as Mick rightly says, the, the mission, we engaged in mission creep. And he can't help contrasting this approach with the first Gulf War by George Bush Sr. back in 1991, when Saddam invaded uh, Kuwait uh, 
And they pushed him back within five weeks, having assembled an international coalition of 35 states, including several Arab ones. And the temptation even then was to march on to Baghdad. But they stopped. And it was exactly um, the right thing to do. So I think it's very important to, uh, to contrast that. Now, Tony Blair uh, has argued that the decision to withdraw was driven by an imbecilic political slogan uh, to end the forever wars. I mean, if I was Tony Blair, having um, presided over the worst foreign policy debacle, the invasion of Iraq since Suez, I would have advised him to keep his head down. But you know Tony Blair. You're never going to do that, right? Uh, he argues that the West is in epoch-changing retreat. Well, it is. And it was summed up uh, nice and neatly on uh, Russia Today, uh, the very day that um, uh, the, the, the Ashraf Ghani government uh, fell and US troops then left. They came, they saw, they lost. And it's surprising, actually, that the West, and the US in particular, learned no lessons from the Soviet experience in Afghanistan from 79 to uh, 89. Um, Afghanistan is known as the graveyard of empires for a reason. It has been the center of great power struggles for centuries. No one has ever won a war there. The Taliban knew that they had to play a waiting game. And the whole thing, as Mick rightly points to, uh, sorry, as Bruno rightly points to, was built on sand. Ashraf Ghani, I remember meeting Ashraf Ghani at a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2005 in Lisbon. And he was very, very smooth. I mean, you, you wouldn't expect anything less from a Columbia-educated world banker. Um, but the reality was that whilst he could dazzle the donors at Davos uh, and, and get 80% of the Afghan economy uh, dependent on aid, the whole thing fell apart within weeks because he had zero respect and his regime was effectively corrupt. I think looking, looking to this more geopolitically, this is indicative of the decline of US hegemony. Uh, I think we're moving away from a unipolar world to a, at least a bipolar world with the rise of China. And that is what Biden's primary focus is. And you have to bear in mind what Robert Putnam, the Harvard professor, used to talk about, which is the two-level game. Biden has got his domestic audience to keep on, on side and to satisfy. And he knows that despite all the protestations from, the, from other Western allies, that only 37% of his own electorate uh, regard the, the withdrawal from Afghanistan as the wrong thing to do. So he's got political cover. And quite honestly, he's more interested in getting his $2 trillion infrastructure bill through uh, the House, which is a complete nightmare for him, and trying to win some seats in midterm elections next year. So he's got his domestic audience to worry about. On the international side, the classic error that he made was not keeping his allies informed and treating them with vaguely, thinly veiled contempt, which was wrong. And I think for him, Biden, as a person who's got four decades of experience in this, former head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, former vice president, we expected more. But the fundamental key focus for Biden going forward is China, and to a lesser extent, Russia. This is great power. This is a great power game. He wants to focus on Asia Pacific and the rise of China there. The irony is that by vacating the field in Afghanistan, it's actually going to play to China's strengths, but that's by the by. I think it was the right thing to, to, to withdraw troops. I think they should have done it 10 years earlier. The tragedy and we all know this, ladies and gentlemen, is for the people of Afghanistan. The remaining there, they're going to have to live under an Islamist theocratic um, state, uh, which shows no signs of any sort of reform. And that is the great tragedy. But I think the West was right to pull out. Thanks, Ali. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thank you, Bruno. <clears throat> so the question was, what happened in Afghanistan? And I think the answer is that Afghanistan and the Western war effort in Afghanistan got caught up in the contradictions of state building and humanitarian imperialism. So a very ambitious project of a globalist project of political reordering that has dominated Western foreign policy, liberal foreign policy for the last 30 years since the end of the Cold War. And it's been justified primarily to a great extent by the relief of suffering. So in the case of Afghanistan, ending Taliban tyranny, protecting Afghan women and girls, and the human rights of um, the Afghan people themselves. So defending the vulnerability and protecting the victims of uh, theocracy, essentially. And the problem is that once that becomes the essential political rationale for Western military intervention, there was no appetite 
for a long-term occupation or for any kind of serious imperial restructuring um, along the lines, say, of 19th century colonialism or anything like that. There was an effort to um, build an Afghan state. There was an effort to withdraw from Afghanistan and to avoid the complications of empire building, which many of, uh, you know, many of the Western foreign policy elites are very familiar with. So there was no appetite or will for any kind of long-term imperial project or oversight. However, right, it's impossible to build a functioning independent state which is based on suppressing claims of sovereign independence. It's impossible to build a functioning independent state which is organized around claims which are legitimated by the idea of victimhood and legitimated around the idea of humanitarian protection. There's a fundamental contradiction between the effort to build functioning institutions of an Afghan state which was meant to stand alone and at the same time the project that was entirely justified in terms of political dependence. And that's a contradiction that West, the Western military effort the Western political effort was never able to extricate itself from. So the argument has been made by a few people, such as um, the uh, former candidate for London Mayor, uh, Rory Stewart, who's still banging on about this. He said, you know, it was, a, it was a mistake to kind of try and build an independent state in a pre-modern society, in a tribal society. And it's an argument that was also made by the American political scientist, Francis Fukuyama. The, it was a, we should have been less ambitious, and we should have simply have um, adapted to the kind of the tribal conditions of Afghan society. But the mistake there is to imagine that they were building an independent modern state. They were never doing that. They were building a state that was dependent on supranational structures. They were building a state that was dependent on Western military support and on Western aid and Western um, uh, foreign support. But more importantly, they were also building a society that had no political authority or claim on the loyalty of Afghans. It was a society, that, a state that was built around ideas of political dependence. So all of its ideological um, basis, all of its claim to political authority was organized externally. And that simply isn't possible. In order, you cannot build a functioning independent state around those um, claims that are oriented entirely externally towards the international community and towards Western states themselves. And so this is the contradiction on which the entire state building project founded in Afghanistan. So I think that idea that the Afghan state had no solid political relationship or institutional or ideological relationship with Afghans themselves is what helps explain the fact that the Afghan state crumbled so quickly in face of the Taliban advance. I think the lesson perhaps that we can draw from it and the le uh, lesson if we can learn it is that the US should not be seen as the ultimate guarantor of political order. Um, and the US shouldn't be seen as the ultimate backstop for social and political life throughout the world. So this logic of humanitarian rescue, that the US is the ultimate, um, the, ultimate um, the final uh, court of appeal in world politics and the place that you go in order to seek support for whatever your position might be, and that the U.S. ultimately guarantees your position should, um, should you know, things finally come to a crunch. I think that is, that is the valuable lesson that can be learned, and I think not only for people in dire straits, beleaguered ethnic minorities and victims of human rights abuses around the world, that they should learn the lesson of not relying on U.S. power. But it's a lesson, I think, that every state should le could learn as well, and even us here. I mean, if we think about the way in which, say, um, Remainers in the UK have taken such delight in the idea that Joe Biden, being of Irish origin, Irish extraction, will punish Britain for its for daring to secede from the European Union, you see the same logic of imagining that the US will come to your rescue, that US politics and US power is ultimately the backstop for all of your domestic, political, and social problems. And if we can rid ourselves of that idea and develop the idea of that we need to be politically self-sufficient and that we can't look to resolve our own internal domestic problems by appeal to US power, then I think that would be at least something valuable that might come um, from the disaster that happened in Kabul um, and the disaster of the last 20 years of the Western intervention in Afghanistan. Thanks for impressive timing, Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Bruno. It's my first time being here at the Battle of 
um, ideas. And before I came, um, I quickly uh, looked up on the website what this was about, and I came across a quote that said, um, those who enjoy the comfort of conventional wisdom will find that the battle of ideas is a very unsafe space. Um, it made me think twice, actually, uh, about what I had to say on the topic of Afghanistan in the last 20 years. Why? Because I've never been a fan of the status quo. Uh, and challenging the status quo and these conventional narratives on Afghanistan as a young British Afghan woman has led to death threats, rape threats, stalking and harassment, mostly from men, not just in the UK, but also from across Europe and North America. You might be wondering, how can Afghanistan be so controversial? Well, uh, it's only controversial to people who do not listen uh, to Afghans on Afghanistan, who want to silence the authentic voices of the people of Afghanistan because it does not fit their conventional wisdoms. I was born in Afghanistan a year after the Soviet Union withdrew and came to the UK as a child refugee, wearing only the clothes I owned. Uh, over the last 20 years, I've been traveling and researching, writing and working on Afghanistan. And throughout this time, I have learned one concrete fact. Afghanistan is still being seen through the prisms of the 18th century, with imperial and colonial aspirations of regional and international powers being experimented on the country. I was confronted with this fact in the early hours of the 16th of August, 2021, a day after the Taliban takeover of Kabul. I was sat in a British military convoy at the Baron Hotel on the outskirts of Kabul International Airport. Sat next to me was my father and next to him another Brit. In the seats in front were two British soldiers, one armed and the other driving. There were 12 other armed convoys like this in front and behind us. As the convoys approached the military side of Kabul Airport, in the darkness of the morning, hundreds of Afghans, desperate to flee the Taliban, had gathered outside the gates. As we waited for the gates to open, on both sides of the military convoy, we were surrounded by Afghan women, children, young boys, girls, and men, all of them holding their passports in their hands. As I looked out the window, the women and the little girls, some aged three or four, stared straight back at me. It was in this moment I saw with my own eyes exactly what failure of political leadership in the Western world looked like. Afghans had been abandoned, once again, to a fate and a to a regime they had not chosen. And since that day, Afghan girls have been denied an education, women have been denied the right to work, public executions, beheadings and hangings are back. But it did not have to be this way. And as I sat in that convoy, I knew what had led us here. It was the continued view of Afghanistan, and as I quote, medieval, tribal, backward, poor, terrorist, corrupt, extremely conservative, extremely religious, anti-women, barbaric, rat-infested, hellhole, with nothing to offer the world and nothing to export. Well, let me correct the record. Afghanistan is a country with thousands of years of history, from Buddhism to Sikhism to Islam. Whilst never being colonized, it has been impacted by the wars of empire due to its geographical location. It is not a country that came into existence in the shadow of part the partition of India in 1947. In fact, it hosted Indian freedom fighters during their fight for independence from colonial Britain. Afghanistan is a country that in 1919 offered all Afghan women full suffrage, a whole year before the United States of America only to see that reversed uh, when the Afghan king was overthrown by the British East India Company. In a country that exported raisins, pomegranates, pine nuts, and many other commodities, even uh, with its ast astronauts exploring outer space with NASA at one point, and not to forget the existence of oil, gemstones, and other valu valuable minerals with current estimates based at one trillion US dollars. I only offer you a glimpse of what Afghanistan was, but we saw what it could have been through the last 20 years after the fall of the Taliban. Afghan women returned to the workplace, taking their rightful place in society as lawyers, teachers, doctors, engineers, and politicians. Afghan girls returned to the classroom with record numbers of girls being educated. Music returned, television returned. Afghans risked their lives to vote and to have a say in the governance of their country, whilst millions more risked their lives defending their country against terrorists and died trying. And yes, it was not perfect, but that's like asking a 20-year-old adult to be perfect. The gains of the last 20 years could never have been sustainable when the Taliban had a home next door in Pakistan, where they were housed, funded, and treated, only to cross into Afghanistan again and again and to attack NATO and the Afghan government and our allies. The gains of the last 20 years could have never been sustainable because the United States did not listen to Afghans when they highlighted this fact and kept funding the Pakistani military. But of course, the blame does not simply fall on regional and international countries. Corruption within the Afghan government, heavy reliance on Afghan warlords and militias, and failed leadership from Afghan politicians also contributed to the downfall of the Islamic Republic. But we cannot ignore the root cause of all this misery, the continued interference of foreign countries in Afghanistan over the last 50 years. 
not just the UK and the US, but Pakistan, Iran, China, and Russia that have led us to this moment. President Biden's decision to keep Trump, Trump's deal with the Taliban in place and withdraw by a set deadline, sidelining the elected Afghan government and having no empathy for Afghans led to my country of birth being handed back to the Taliban. It is why today many of my friends are in hiding or on the run from the Taliban. Others have already ended up dead. Abandonment is what I witnessed on that dark morning as that convoy finally started moving into the side of Kabul airport. When I finally sat on that RAF plane, I knew I would survive another day, that my future looked okay. But so many others, like those little Afghan girls who stared at me, their future does not look okay. If we want to end this misery in Afghanistan, then we need to start at home and challenge our own perceptions about why we do not listen to Afghans when it comes to their own country. Thank you. got a lot to work with, um, in a, the positive sense um, of the word, lots of timber to build the house. Um, I just want to start um, just just here on the, on, on the panel before coming out to the audience, just to, to talk a little bit more about some of the things that have been raised. Bruno, you you, you talked about everything collapsing, um, the, the, the fact there wasn't an evacuation uh, organised, even though the Americans you know, were pulling out. Um, and I just want to to develop that a bit more because one of the things that was very striking in the aftermath this summer was the kind of criticism that was 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 leveled at the americans the, the, one of the things that americans have always retained is despite evidence to the con all the evidence to the contrary is this idea of mi certainly military competence particularly among the europeans particularly among the british and some of the criticism that was made by the europeans made by the british people like ben wallace um i just how you know do do, do you is, is this the biggest blow to the myth even, but the idea of American military uh, competence? Is it, is it, as you were saying, you're, you're, you're uh, the tech guy, you know, you know you've got to tear it all up. Is it, is, it, is it that bad for the Americans? I think it is. You've seen only one defense against that argument, that Afghanistan didn't matter. We were terrible there, but we were terrible because this wasn't really important. But when it's really important, like Taiwan, then we'll be back to our <coughs> usual competence and might, uh, which seems to me a, a, a rather impossible argument, because if, the, if it didn't matter, why were, they, were you there for 20 years, right? Uh, it seems to, to be sort of a last resource argument. If you go to the Wikipedia page, uh, Afghanistan War, you'll see that it, it has a summary, something like, uh, began 2001, ended in 2001, uh, outcome Taliban won. And I don't think it's been corrected yet. I mean, that's the truth of the matter, uh, that the, the United States was in Afghanistan to defeat the Taliban. If you read the original records, the original documents, Rumsfeld, everyone else, it wasn't about al-Qaeda primarily. It was about defeating the Taliban. The Taliban was the regime in Afghanistan. We're there to defeat uh, By the way, in the first year or so, it was difficult to find who exactly the Taliban were. Uh, this new book, Afghanistan Papers, uh, gives a good summary of that, how the Americans wasn't even sure who the Taliban were. Is it uh, just uh, uh, some, some, are all Pashtuns Taliban or not? And they're asking these questions of, of tribal leaders, trying to find out who the Taliban exactly are. And by 2003, Americans are starting to realize that the Taliban is actually more of a sociological reality than an organized group. And that's when it becomes very difficult to continue uh, believing in a final victory. So in the end, uh, it is a military defeat, but it's also, uh, and more immediately, a logistical defeat, an intelligence uh, failure. Uh, I saw the other day General Milley, uh, chairman of Joint Staffs, saying that uh, it was a strategic failure, but a logistical success. Uh, and then I was on a, on a panel with Leon Panetta last week, and I, uh, he, he came back to that argument. I had to say, no, and in my opinion, it was a strategic failure and logistical failure. Yeah, the airplanes worked, but logistics is not about airplanes. It's about intelligence, planning, organization, and all that failed. So again, going back to the beginning, uh, it seems that you either believe that this was a one-off because the U.S. forces were not really committed to Afghanistan anymore, or then you might draw different conclusions. But just to conclude, I, I wonder, uh, and I think it's important, what people in Beijing are thinking about this, whether they think it was uh, a one-off or whether they think it actually means something more. And then they might plan accordingly. Um, so 
Phil, you were saying um, that, that this is a real blow um, to the idea of, of, of humanitarian imperialism, slightly pejorative. Humanitarian interventionism, which was the, the, the buzz of the 90s, um, you know, it was the rehabilitation of the idea that you could um, even nation build um, in other countries. So without humanitarian interventionism, without um, the relief of, of suffering, where does that lead? Where does that leave uh, the West? So, I mean, I, I don't know that it's, uh, it's fully uh, disintegrated the claims for humanitarian imperialism. Rather, I try to make the case that it, it could be the lesson that we could learn, and not just the idea of humanitarian imperialism in the sense of defending uh, beleaguered ethnic minorities in distant places, but the idea that all of political life around the world is ultimately dependent on American power. I mean, I think it runs much deeper than the assumption of um, the Americans defending uh, people who are being oppressed or victimized. Um, I mean, you know, the, uh, the assumption, I think, of it, if you watch any kind of dystopian sci-fi um, movie, you know, like there's always the idea the Americans come in. At the end of the day, there is uh, the helicopters come and there is an effort to save, and that the American state is ultimately the backstop of world, or not only world order but also social order domestically. Um, and that seems to me to be uh, that seems to me the uh, the idea that we need to reject, um, or at least the lesson to be drawn from the fall of Kabul is not to rely on American power. And what replaces the um, what the that space that has been occupied by ideas of humanitarian rescue and nation building is an open question. But it's see, a lot of it, I mean, a lot of these arguments are being recycled um, as part of the new Cold War with China. So you see, for example, the claims being made um, about the, um, the oppression of the Uyghur people in, um, in China itself as a justification for the new Cold War. So humanitarian arguments being repurposed to new forms of conflict. Um, but I think also we're likely to see, you know, it will be almost impossible for the next administration that follows the Biden administration not to have some kind of demonstrative um, uh, flexing of American power just to, just to indicate American credibility. And that, I think, will be uh, dangerous in itself. So, again, on that theme, on, on, on the idea, um, you know, potentially of a new Cold War, China, and certainly there seems to be increasing militarization in that in the Indo um, Pacific. And Bruno raises the, the question of this kind of you know basic lack of competence, let alone not having a sense of mission. How is that regarded in Beijing? Does that make Beijing more more competent? Can can you you were talking about you know George uh, George W going uh, to war on a now, an abstract now? Um, where does that leave? The United States in a at a time when there are new rising powers and there is actually a real competition, not a Potemkin village, um, yeah. with with China. Yeah, it's very difficult to say uh, with uh, certainty. Um, I do think we recognise the seriousness of this as a setback for American uh, power in the world. Um, I agree with the argument that uh, my colleagues on Spike put forward that this is a what happened in uh, Afghanistan is a bigger blow to American prestige than Saigon and Vietnam, uh, in the sense that, at least in, in Vietnam, they, America lost for two reasons, because they're up against a very well-organized, um, incredibly committed uh, national liberation movement uh, backed by the Soviet Union, and because they had a mass anti-war movement in America. Neither of those things applied in Afghanistan, but they still managed to lose. They're up against an absolute ragtag organization. When uh, America invaded, or when the West intervened in 2001, it wasn't actually Western troops fighting on the ground. It was mostly done by their proxies in the Northern Alliance. And when the Northern Alliance arrived at Kabul, the Taliban did what the Afghanistan government did this time. They just cleared off without a fight. They were, they were really uh, uh, nothing of any substance. <coughs> Compared to North Vietnam, nothing. And there was no anti-war movement. Uh, in America to compare with the Vietnam movement at all. Um, but I think what you have is a, in the American establishment, is a, like a moral defeat, a moral defeatism, a kind of loss of a sense of purpose in the world that, uh, as people indicate, they will have to try and find some kind of outlet for it. But I think it's a very serious problem for them. The one thing they've got 
that we've all got to hope for, is that um, actually there's no one trying to start a third world war at the moment. Uh, neither China or America are particularly uh, uh, interested in that. But certainly international tensions uh, are rising as a consequence. And America's falling um, capital and the fact that its allies, who, which, as it, the question has been asked, which, America, which ally is going to trust America next time? It's going to, who's going to trust American promises? Um, is a very serious step back forward. Yeah, so I'd, I'd, I'd like that. I, I, I want now to, to follow up on that and um, the, the sense of betrayal, actually. Um, and I, I've, I, as a journalist, I've gone to Calais quite a lot um, because of the, the whole sort of migrant and uh, illegal crossings and all the rest of it. And you do get, you get quite a few, um, usually guys from Afghanistan. And one of the things that's really tragic about them is they always have a piece of paper uh, they always, or even a folder, and it's all references from um, either Western NGOs or you know base commanders, and it says you know um, Ahmed here is great bulldozer driver. I'll give them a reference, and they they are they they they're clutching onto this because they hope this will save them. Um, uh, um, not that the French CRS or the British Border Force are that impressed with those references. And I just I, I, I want to ask you. First, actually, Paymana, is, is, is that, that sense of uh, betrayal, which you obviously feel um, keenly, what kind of consequences should that have? What you, you, you once said, you're, you're, you're a founder member of the, the Labour Foreign Policy Group. Um, if, if, imagine Lisa Nandy, who's a very nice person, good, good egg, she's sitting right there. What, what, what lesson, what consequences in terms of our politics and policy here should that betrayal have? So I don't know if this is, this is about consequences, but I think this is about a lesson learned. Um, one of the things that I've noticed over the last 20 years, um, having been very immersed in the issue of Afghanistan, watching it on television from home, going traveling to Afghanistan, meeting with Afghans, is that when Western politicians speak about the country, they do it for a reason, um, and they, they have another purpose to it. So you might have noticed over the last maybe three weeks in September, late August, <laughs> There was a lot of news about Afghanistan um, coming out uh, in the newspapers, lots of commentary from lots of people who probably have never visited Afghanistan, but suddenly wanted to have an opinion on the country because it was relevant. So the lesson I think the West needs to learn is don't talk about Afghanistan after the, the incidents have happened, after the things have already taken place and things have already gone wrong. You need to consider it as a priority because we're looking at women and girls right now in hiding. You know, I'm dealing with people in the Afghan National Defense Security Forces who were female officers trained by the United Kingdom who are in hiding now because the Taliban are hunting them down. That is the reality of what we're dealing with. Uh, and so the, the question asked on this panel is, you know, can there be other countries that will trust America again? I would say, do not trust America again because they will turn their back on you uh, when it's time, when the time's up. Um, so what I'd say to Lisa Nandia, what I'd say to Boris Johnson, what I'd say to any politician is please don't use Afghanistan for internal domestic politics and actually consider it for the country that it is and, and consider the lives of the Afghan people. Um, Ali, I want to ask you, I'm gonna, I, I haven't warned you about this. Um, you, um, you, you arrange financing for uh, infrastructure uh, mm -hmm. projects and we know, we know that the... The amount of money that, that's gone into Afghanistan um, in, in, in this 20-year period is considerable, even measured in, in billions. It's considerable. Um, and one of the um, aspects of, of, of former empires, certainly thinking of sort of railways in India and all the rest of it, um, was at least the building um, a, a part of it. Um, what, what, would you, what do you think you would have been able to do with all those billions um, in um, Afghanistan, and 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 um, do you think that just in the terms of what has been built and infrastructure, um, that twenty years has has served um, the Afghan people in any way? Well, look, I mean, uh, the, the West spent uh, two trillion uh, on this misadventure in Afghanistan. So yes, I mean, there there's uh, several pieces of infrastructure built, uh, which is all very welcome, but fundamentally. If you go back to the neoconservative prescription, which was regime change, advocated by Rumsfeld, uh, Cheney, Wolfowitz, uh, and George Bush Jr. himself, it's utterly, patently failed. 
uh, and, and this is, this is, I mean, when will the West learn the lessons of hubris? We've had a failure in Afghanistan. We've had a failure in Iraq. We've had a failure in, in uh, Libya. We almost went into Syria and screwed that up as well. Um, when does the West learn these lessons? So, look, it's fine to build pieces of infrastructure, but now you've got the situation just to that point where you've got Pakistan, who's always had an interest in Afghanistan, next door, Imran Khan has been a, a long supporter of the Taliban. We know that the uh, Pakistani intelligence service, the ISI, covertly supported the Mujahideen uh, from 79 to 89, and the Soviets were there, in turn, getting money from the CIA. By the way, bin Laden was a member of the Mujahideen, so it's interesting how these things go full circle. Uh, and now uh, Imran Khan is saying that uh, the Afghans, uh, the Taliban rather, have thrown off the shackles of slavery, and he's sitting pretty uh, with the Taliban uh, back in power next door. So you've got to keep in mind that the, the, the Pakistan-China economic corridor, by which uh, China is investing... 64 billion dollars uh, into that corridor going all the way down to Gwadar port um, in the Arabian Sea. China has got uh, economic mining interests uh, in Afghanistan. But the contrast with, Ch with China and the US is the Chinese have got no interest in exporting communism anywhere. They just follow the money. They, they've got a rapacious appetite to extract resources and to build up their economic power across the new Silk Road. For them, it's fundamentally an economic argument, not an argument about spreading values uh, and democracy, uh, which I think is a fool's errand. Right, I want to come out to um, the audience. Can you stick your hands up? I am from Afghanistan. I was recently there until a um, very short while ago. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank Paimana for being one of the only ones to actually talk about the Afghan people, because I think um, it's very um, sad to talk about whether it was a success or not in a very black and white and almost robotic manner because i think people for the past 20 years have actually lived there they've built lives there they were able to go to school they're able to work so so i really think that the lives of people should be taken into consideration when you talk about the successes of the past 20 years and the question which bruno asked whether the u.s was caught off guard I think that in 2019, when Mike Pompeo shook hands with terrorists and essentially handed 35 million people over to the Taliban, they knew where they were getting. They essentially didn't care. And I think that's the symbolic betrayal that the Afghan people feel. And I think when Phil frames it as a humanitarian rescue, I don't think it is a humanitarian rescue. I think it's an obligation and a duty for the West, who have essentially ruined the lives of 35 million people, to uh, to take action, and action can look like the smallest of things, like holding the Taliban accountable when they don't let girls go to school, when they conduct public hangings over the past week. These things are happening when the government is busy discussing the legitimacy of the withdrawal and whether the past 20 years was a good idea or not. The people in Afghanistan don't care to answer these questions. They want governments to hold the Taliban accountable, and unfortunately, that hasn't been happening for the past month, and I just wish uh, maybe the panel is not a, a right place for it. I just wish in a broader political sense, those are the questions that should be asked instead of very uh, uh, questions on, on the past and rhetorical questions. Yeah. Okay, I think, um, I think it'd be lazy of us to, um, to come away from this thinking uh, it's primarily a military failure and a failure of government. Uh, and considering it's largely a kind of liberal leftish leaning audience, we can kind of be a bit complacent about this. I just want to make it worse because in my mind this is a catastrophic cultural and societal failure. Where were the left during all of this? I mean, you know, where was the democratic movement when they were calling, you know, George W. Bush a dictator and Tony Blair a liar? You know, where was the opposition in this period? Well, I'll tell you where they were. A lot of them were taking the money in Afghanistan. A lot of them went, you know, with misgivings, officially, went over there and, as beautifully shown in Adam Curtis's uh, documentary, Bitter Lake, teaching, so, you know, liberated young Afghan girls about Marcel Duchamp's urinal uh, because they thought that conceptual art would somehow help them understand democracy. That's where they were. That's where the think tanks were. That's where, you know, many civil society, voluntary organizations, they went over there 
They took the money, they supported the effort, and I think it's time we called them out. Not just the generals who said we're there kicking the, the Vietnam spirit, but the whole shebang, cultural, societal support, and absolute silence as to the catastrophe that started on day one. Kerry yeah. Gingle from the charity World Right and uh, World Buys film crew. Quick things. Um, first of all, why is it we can't learn the lessons of history? What is it about that? I don't have a PhD in international relations, but can have a conversation with any young person that I work with about how would you feel if the Afghanistan military came to Britain and imposed rule on us? Would that be okay? Would you be happy with it? No, absolutely not. Makes complete sense that that contempt for the people of Afghanistan makes the idea all of Iraq, you know, or of Libya, or of anywhere else in the world that we intervene, denying people their agency can never, ever be fruitful. Not because of some great cultural difference, but actually because of our universal humanity, that we aren't prepared to be sat on from on high. Why can't we learn that? Uh, that to me is very important. And just second quick question, because I think Mick alluded to it but didn't have time to get to it, I'm also worried about the anti-Western consequences and fallout of what has happened in the anti-Americanism or whatever, um, which does no favours for anybody in Britain or globally either. Thank you all very much. Um, the name's Ewan Grant. I'm a former law enforcement intelligence analyst who's worked in Central Asia and in Pakistan, where um, saw some very interesting things regarding Gwadar and the Chinese influence. I also worked on another occasion with alongside um, Ukrainians who were Afghansky veterans of the Soviet army in Afghanistan and noticed how it was clear that their message was the message that was not being heard by NATO, because it was the very much same message about what's going on. My question is 100% um, endorsing the gentleman over here who made the point about the uh, international aid gravy train uh, criticisms, huge criticisms there. My question is, um, what should replace US power in the Indian o greater Indian Ocean region and what do you think will replace it for good or ill? Thank you. Um, just before I come to my question, um, so Vietnam uh, and more recently Afghanistan have proven that whenever America tries to project its power in a military fashion, it, it fails miserably, uh, although unfortunately they've been more successful uh, in the economic power projection front. But my question was, um, the spike editor in chief uh, started by uh, explaining the, how, the narr how the narrative uh, for invading Afghanistan started and how it changed over the years and what, a link, what the link was to 9-11. But uh, I just want to know, uh, what was the narrative behind Iraq? Why Iraq? Uh, how was Iraq linked uh, to Afghanistan and 9-11? Yeah, I, I agree with the one that speaks about the neoconservative about neoconservatism, um, which which led Woolwich and Pearl, um, but I don't think it's a reproduce, uh, uh, re reproduce him, him telling the French, because I think Kosovo is a good example. But my concern is, is actually uh, Joe Biden, Donald Trump done the deal because the actual American people wanted their troops home. So it's with domestic politics as well. And actually a lot of British people wanted our boys home. So do we all bear a responsibility because the government, the government listened to her opinion polls to get our boys home? One topic that hasn't been, that's been glossed over is the fact that oil companies that have invested, that a lot of the time have invested interest in keeping the Middle East destabilised and decentralised because that allows them to manipulate oil prices. And I think that's something that we should talk about a little more. Genuine question, because I don't know. There's no such thing as a government or a regime, however oppressive and however military, that doesn't have a basis of support somewhere in the population. Otherwise, it cannot last. Is there such a basis for, of support for the Taliban somewhere in Afghan society? And if so, what is it? What I want to do 
very, very quickly, I want to bring back the panel, but real, real bullet points. So, so I'm not going to bring back the whole panel. So if you really want to say anything about this, I want someone to answer, how do you hold the Taliban accountable? Um, so is anyone, anyone, Paymana perhaps, on this one? <laughs> okay. How do you hold the Taliban accountable? That's going to be very, very difficult. But one of the ways that you can hold is obviously with, withholding legitimacy um, and having discussions before you even go into recognizing a, a regime like the Taliban. I would say do not recognize the Taliban regime until they make strides on things like women's rights, uh, girls going back to school, uh, and various other uh, issues like making sure that there's an inclusive government, maybe even elections, and holding a lawyer jagger, doing it the traditional Afghan way. If the Taliban consider themselves Afghans, then they need to do it the Afghan way that they've been talking about all this time. So, so I think that the Western governments can hold the Taliban accountable by withholding um, the Afghan central bank reserves and using that um, as a way, as as well as Western international aid. Okay, and the, the, the other thing that's intriguing me, um, um, on the back of, of what Ali was saying as well, is that one of the very striking things about China and Beijing, which is everywhere, um, uh, and uh, you know, in terms of uh, particularly economic um, intervention, um, but it doesn't export a model. Um, it doesn't export uh, a China model. Um, does that mean it really is going to be um, China's century, given that the United States and the West did have a model, in fact, that the international order is structured on it, but doesn't seem to have one anymore if the limits to projecting its sense of mission, the, mission, if the limits to projecting itself is, is as one, uh, someone in the audience said, teaching girls about surreal toilet installations. Has anyone on the panel got a view on this? Not Ali, because he raised it. Can I just come in on this? Because um, DFID, for example, in, in Afghanistan, spent money on trying to create an Afghan girls rugby team. Um, and that's because they have a specific budget for sports uh, and they felt that they had to do it. Now, culturally, that doesn't make sense for, for a lot of Afghan women. Um, it might have been more useful to use that money somewhere else um, for, for Afghan women and girls. Um, there is also the, the understanding that, that you know, some of uh, the aid in, in Afghanistan has been used on projects like this. Um, for example, on pink balloons. Um, so um, back in 2011 or 2012, um, there was an organization that got funding from a Western um, aid agency and came in and put out pink balloons uh, in Kabul city, um, saying that this would help um, bring about the discussion about poverty and inequality. Um, so you can see how, how, how crazy that sounds right now. But back then, it seemed like a viable project for, for a Western aid agency to fund. I'll just say one thing, which is not in relation to what you were just asking for, which is, um, you know, there's a kind of underlying discussion about would it have been better if the West had stayed or if they'd left? Uh, you know, because something mm -hmm. had changed in the last yeah. 20 years for the better, and now they've gone, the Taliban have come back. So would it have been better if they stayed if they got... The way I look at this is there's an old, um, not to be flippant, but there's an old country joke about a, a, a bloke from the town who's lost in the countryside, doesn't know where he is, and he sees a local... Goes up to him and says, he'll, he says, he'll know where he says, excuse me, can you tell me how to get to Newtown, please? And the local says, well, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> and that's really the situation that you're in Afghanistan, right? Once the, the West are in there, if they stay, it's a disaster. If they withdraw, it's a disaster. And there is not an easy, positive solution that you can offer anybody, other than saying we're in favour of the Afghan people taking charge of their own destiny, which is a very kind of... A, a, a high-minded idea that is difficult to implement. So the problem, we have to go back 20 years and say the problem is in the intervention in the first place and the sustaining of the intervention over those 20 years. Because once they're in, there was never going to be anything but a disastrous uh, outcome. And uh, that's why I think we've got, got to go back to first principles when we're talking about intervention and the idea that we can create a, a state or a nation for somebody else. It's just not going to happen in any, any way that's worth it. Yeah, just to pick up on Mick's point, I, I'm certainly I'm confused uh, uh, like, on what Pamanda's position is in terms of, you know, are you arguing that the West should have stayed there? And if so, for how long? Because I, I'm just not clear what the argument is. Is the argument that, A, they should have never deposed the Taliban in the first place, which was vicious even 20 years ago? Right. So was it wrong to go in at all? Right. Even if it was 9-11, but then it expanded out to this other thing. So firstly, was it wrong? Now, what should be the answer? I mean, Lady in the Front as well uh, ma mentioned this point. What, what, how long do you want them to stay? That's one point. The other thing is, on this point about, you know, allies won't trust the US anymore. This is such a load of guff. Uh, 
I met I met Musharraf in 2001 in London when he was and he said, look, I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. And he said, my aim is to get as much bounty out of the US before they ditch us again. A reference to what they did after 89, after the Soviets left and they stopped funding the Mujahideen, right? So this is priced in by allies. If you're in the Indo-Pacific and you're in a dangerous region, you're going to depend on yourself, right? And you're going to cozy up to who you think it's in your self-interest to do so. So reliance on the US, it's already priced in. You know, people don't believe that the US is a reliable ally. Phil? So it was just in response to um, a question right from the back about um, what will replace US power in the Indo-Pacific. And I'm always struck by these kinds of debates as if this debate is taking place in Washington or in the Beltway among the think tanks that are connected to the Pentagon and to US government. Um, what is, I mean, why, you know, how is it a debate, apart from the fact that Britain was only there for the, uh, the sake of maintaining the alliance with the US, in terms that was the only kind of strategic rationale and that was entirely threadbare. Um, the humanitarian logic was very, you know, was the overriding aim and that's also been shot to pieces. So why do we have these discussions as if we're part of uh, discussing what US foreign policy should be rather than what British, um, what British foreign policy should be? It's bizarre. I think it, it could have been possible for American power to be exercised in a different way. I mean, Phil made very good points about it. This, this search for absolute power, the search for a relationship with the Afghan government where they pick up your phone and they follow every instruction. I mean, you know mm -hmm. that uh, uh, Hamid Karzai was discussing what, uh, what the new flag should be with the American ambassador over breakfast. Uh, so when it gets to this point where you project your fantasies upon Afghanistan, then, of course, what you're building is not solid and built on sand. It's going to collapse once, once it's under pressure. But I don't think we should necessarily conclude that this is the only way you can exercise power abroad. I don't think we should necessarily conclude that you should withdraw because then you're just creating a vacuum that others will occupy. How about rethinking from the ground up the way you exercise power and concluding very simply, as Phil suggested, we have to relate to other societies as equals. Is that so difficult? I think it just doesn't... We don't even try, and then we complain that it doesn't work. Okay. Um, so, uh, just to answer Ali's question, um, yes, it was the right thing for us to do to go into Afghanistan and get rid of the Taliban regime. Um, no Afghan wanted US troops or NATO troops to stay there forever. You have to understand that. No Afghan wanted US troops to stay there forever. The question really is how you leave and the way you leave and what kind of plan you have and treating Afghans as equals. And that brings me on to this point, is if the West had listened to Afghans right from the start, we would not be in this mess. And let me give you an example. In the Bonn Conference of 2001, Afghans had picked a different leader and the West chose Hamid Karzai as the president. The Afghans said, bring back the king, the former king, as a unifying figure. The West refused to do that. that those are two key things that the West refused to do that Afghans wanted. The other third thing that the, the Afghans said is include the Taliban in negotiations of a new setup for a government. The West refused to do that. That's why the Taliban re-emerged in 2006. Why do you think that there was no fighting between 2001 and 2006? Where were the Taliban then? They were waiting. They were waiting to be included. And the United States refused because they were angry over what happened on 9-11. So if you treated Afghans as equal, we wouldn't be in this mess. Right. Back to you in the audience, hands up. Yeah, I'm astonished by what you're saying, because before in your speech you said, I'm proud to be from Afghanistan and I'm proud of all my heritage. But then at the same time, you're, you, are, you are in favour, you, you are just said that you are in favour of Western intervention in your country. And let's go back to the 2001. They didn't care less about your country. They bombed the hell out of your own people. And therefore, I'm supporting what Mike McHugh had to say, that I was always against the intervention in Afghanistan. But what I want to ask the panel is the consequences of the defeat, because even if you, I'm against the I'm, I'm, I was against the war, the fact is that the West has lost a war against a bunch of people who are not sophisticated. The, America and the Western powers are the most sophisticated powers in the world, and we lost a war. So the consequence, and what I want to ask the panel about the consequences, there are Western analysts who argue that there are still enemies, and it's not China. You still have terrorists out there who, are, who use the ideology, or use Islam as an ideology to counterattack the West. 
So what I want to ask you is, what do you think about these Western analysts who say that they will infiltrate the Taliban? The Taliban has still connection with this, and that this war is not ended. I think uh, Paymana's point is very well made, um, that we to understand what happened over the last 20 years, we need to think about the perspective of the Afghani people. But it does then raise another question, and, and again, if someone asked before, earlier on, genuine question, are there currents um, uh, among people in Afghanistan that support the Taliban? And I don't know. And what I'd like to ask is really, I guess, is, well, who are the Afghani people? What are in their totality? And is there a unified view? And uh, um, what are the divisions there? And when we talk about holding the Taliban to account, what forces in the wider Taliban society are there that you, that you think would be able to do that um, and could uh, maybe work together with other sections of society to, um, to advance the rights of women, say, is it necessary always to rely on the external? Is there an internal solution to this? Okay. Hi, just a really quick one. Um, how do we help women and girls now, and also the often neglected um, gay people? How do we help them now that we're in this situation? That's it. Hi. Um, so there were a few audience members that questioned if there was legitimacy of the Taliban within Afghanistan. And my answer to that would be that it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter whether they have legitimacy because they refuse to participate in civil society and are essentially holding a whole country hostage. Therefore, if you think that they have support from civil society, that's what the Afghan people have been asking to participate in civil society, to hold elections, to hold any form of traditional elections if the Western form of democracy is something that you oppose. Therefore, at this stage of the question, I don't think it's a matter of whether there is support for them or not on the ground because we have no way of measuring this support and they refuse to enforce any processes to measure this support. Um, I'm actually really glad you mentioned the Bonn conference. I'm surprised it took so long. I'd just like to go over a brief timeline of the start of the war. So September 2001, on the 11th, obviously we've got the 9-11 attacks. A month later, not even a month later, October 7th, the US goes to war in Afghanistan. There's not enough time to plan a war. Then, less than two months later, in December, then we finally have the Bonn, bon Accords, where the US lays out its plan for occupation and for the restoration of the Afghani government. It wasn't enough time. What was poorly planned out from the very beginning, it should never have happened. Okay, gentlemen there. Um, I'm, I'm kind of wondering sometimes whether this discussion is like uh, in a parallel universe, in the sense that if you read people like Brzezinski, like this is, this is part of the grand plan for Central Asia. But also in, in kind of dollar terms, this, the, the Afghanistan occupation, has been an absolutely massive transfer of wealth to uh, the military industrial complex. And that doesn't, that doesn't uh, it's, not, it's not going over to help Afghan young women. It's like, it's fattening up more of recruitment and all the rest of them. Okay. Right, we're going to, as is traditional, we're going to finish in reverse order. So we'll begin with Paymana. You get a chance to sum up for two minutes. Um, and then uh, it will be Phil, Ali, Mick. And Bruno gets the, the final word. So you've got two minutes to make it punchy. Okay. <laughs> Intervention is complicated. Uh, it's not black and white. Um, so you can't just say that you were for the bombing of your country. No, I was not. Uh, I've spoken out against um, the experimentation of bombs uh, in Afghanistan. For example, the mother of all bombs that was dropped in Jalalabad uh, by President Trump in the aim of removing Daesh. And now we see the resurgence of Daesh across Afghanistan. So what happened there? That's the question. So what I want people to understand and to think about is when you discuss the Afghan people, you think about their lives, um, and, and especially in regards to intervention. So are we saying that uh, in this debate that it was OK to see an Afghan woman kneeling at Kabul's football stadium with a Taliban fighter holding a gun to her head and executing her? Is that what we're okay with? That's the question I have for everyone in regards to intervention. If we're okay with that and we're okay to see those kinds of images on our screens, then fine, 
be anti-intervention. So yes, there were Afghans who uh, lobbied the United States for intervention in Afghanistan to get rid of, of this regime in Afghanistan, and it was the right decision to, to make. In terms of support for the Taliban, you know, this, this is really, really difficult. The question really here is, is fear a, a, a mechanism or, or a metric of how we're, we're measuring support? Because if someone came into your village with guns and told you that they are now in charge, otherwise they're going to kill your family members, what choice do you have? You go with what will keep peace in your family, in your home. And that's what many Afghans across villages across Afghanistan have done. So, so, so I want us to remember when we talk about Afghanistan and we talk about the Afghan people, we're talking about people's lives here. This isn't just about intervention or non-intervention. This is about the Afghan people and the lives of these people on the ground. Thank you. So my two concluding thoughts, the first one would be that after 20 years of the forever war in Afghanistan, but also the war in Iraq, the war in Libya, the bombing of Syria, um, we need to be ruthlessly suspicious of rationales for permanent war. And we need to hold our governments to account for rationales for permanent war. And the most effective and powerful rationale and justification for permanent war that has been offered over the last 20, 30 years has been protecting the vulnerable, protecting belie the beleaguered minorities, protecting people who can't protect themselves. And those justifications are always very easy to do, right? It's very easy for the great and the good in Western capitals to claim to act on behalf of the, power, of the powerless precisely because the powerless can't hold them to account. And so all of these justifications for forever war that are based in terms of defending the vulnerable, we have to reject them. And that, I think, is the lesson of the fall of Kabul. That is the lesson of the last 20 years of forever war. And the final thought it would be somebody mentioned, or it was Bruno and Ali who were talking about infrastructure. Um, the Taliban are now the most well-armed jihadis in the world because they've inherited all the Black Hawk helicopters and Humvees and armaments that the US has left for them. The only justification and rationale for public spending in Western societies in the last 20 years has been warfare, essentially, right? And the real question about infrastructure shouldn't be what happened in Afghanistan, but what's happened in the US. All public health infrastructure was evidently completely decayed as a result of the COVID pandemic. And infrastructure more generally, roads, airports, railways, it's falling to bits. You only need to go to a major American city to see how decayed public life is in the US itself. And that should be what we should think about when we think about what has been left in Afghanistan and what has been absent. Nation building in America has been absent while they've been nation building in Afghanistan. Ali. I think one of the points made by someone in the audience was uh, that, you know, the West intervention ended in failure, you know, how, how terrible. Most interventions in Afghanistan over hundreds of years have ended in failure, so uh, the West is in good company. Um, to Pomana's point about, you know, images of uh, Taliban soldiers pointing guns at uh, women's heads, of course that's abhorrent, right? No one wants to see that. But the abuse of women and girls in Afghanistan is not the only country in which this is happening. And we do not engage in military interventions all over the world. We have to use other means, right? And we have to have a ruthless pursuit of what we regard to be in our own um, national uh, foreign policy interest, right? And misadventures in foreign countries is not the way. There are other ways, economic sanctions, diplomatic pressure, other means you have to deal with. And when we come to the point, uh, you know, what do the Afghan people want? The Afghan people, 30, 40 million people. I mean, do we know what we want in Britain for Pete's sake? I mean, are we united? Are the US united? There are 30 to 40 million people. Why, why, why do we expect there to be a universal Afghan view on who their government should be, right? Of course there shouldn't be. I mean, finally, what do we do now on women and girls and the country in general? There's limited leverage that the West has. There is some, but it's limited. It's going to be around aid. But fundamentally, the Afghans, uh, the Taliban in particular here, have got options. They've got China, they've got Pakistan, they've got others they can go to. Uh, but they do crave recognition, and we have to use what leverage we can to try and extract uh, any assurances at this stage that we that we deem uh, sort of realistic, but it's not a, it's not going to be an easy uh, task for us, and I think it's uh, that's where we are. Uh, yes, um, I know even less about uh, what the people in Afghanistan think at the moment than the CIA do, so I'm not going to speculate uh, about that. But I do. There's a couple of very important lessons for us in the West. It is absolutely the case that the Af 
the will of the Afghan people has never been listened to in this discussion because, as I said at the beginning of the, of the debate, it was never about Afghanistan. It was never about Afghanistan. That was a backdrop for the West to uh, project a kind of uh, a power and a sense of mission. So for us in the West, I think there's two lessons uh, from this disaster. Um, one is that we should not stand for any excuses for any more interventions by our governments, which are just forms of uh, political um, uh, virtue signalling uh, in other people's misery. Um, and we should not accept any excuses for that. And we, should, we need to have a, an anti-interventionist movement uh, of, of principle in, the, in Western society. The other thing is, that, however, that we need to sort out what we believe in our society is worth fighting for. I think, you know, Klaus Rich said a long time ago that um, war is the uh, pursuit of politics by other means. Well, now it seems to me war is becoming the pursuit of culture war politics by other means. So we need to get to the basis of what actually does our society stand for? What are we prepared to fight for? You cannot go to Afghanistan and say, we're here to fight for democracy and women's rights uh, and free speech, when the same uh, uh, establishment is undermining all of those principles in our own societies. So we need to have a very hard look at ourselves. What do we stand for and what is worth fighting for? So I'd like to go back to two ideas that I think are extremely misguided. Phil already mentioned this, this idea that Rory Stewart and others have defended also a lot in America, that um, the U.S. was too ambitious in Afghanistan. Because I, I happen to think the U.S. was not ambitious enough, but, but let me explain. So now there's this narrative that the U.S. won militarily against Al-Qaeda, it's no longer the Taliban, it's Al-Qaeda. But then he had a second goal, which is too ambitious to realize, which is to transform Afghanistan into a free democratic society. Well, that, that's not really the way to read what happened. The goal was not ambitious at, at all. The goal was merely, after 2010, to prepare an exit strategy. So you had to create some modicum of support for the government so that you can leave. And you have to create the illusion that the war is over. And that's what the investment was about. Create a little bit of support, you can get out and say the war is over. There was never any attempt to make Afghanistan less poor. And look at the numbers, since 2010, GDP per capita didn't grow at all. There was no attempt to make Afghanistan a more open society or a more democratic society or a more sovereign, more independent society. None at all. It was just about the exit strategy. It was not about Afghanistan. And the second idea that I find is very misguided is, it's a bit riskier, this idea of abstract human rights. Because some of the points you made, I think, are, it was what struck me in Kabul, all my visits there. You have, for example, young women uh, whose families made a huge amount of financial effort to put them in university. And where the American ambassador was going to these meetings and say, yes, you should do this, put her in university. And you know, the family would, was worried, are we sure, is Afghanistan going to be safe? And there were assurances from the American government, the American ambassador, that it was OK. Now imagine for a moment that these uh, American promises were not under the jurisdiction of a moral imperative of human rights, but they were actually under the jurisdiction of a court. Uh, enforceable. You know, there was a promise made, a guarantee made, and it's not being honored. Now, it, has to, it could be honored in different ways. An evacuation of some of the people at danger, which had to be much better planned and much more expensive, or then uh, demanding from the Taliban a certain level of concessions. But what strikes me, it's somehow we have these abstract human rights, which then are completely dropped out immediately because you say Afghanistan is not ready for human rights. Let's try to think about concrete people, the human being in front of you, to whom you said, you can put your, your daughter in university because we'll always be here. And then you're not there two, two years later. You know, any court would say, there's a compensation here. But unfortunately, it's not under the jurisdiction of a court. It's under the jurisdiction of universal human rights. Could you thank the panel, please?